Okay, it is uh, noon, and so I think we should go ahead and get started, being respectful of everybody's time. Uh, thanks for being here, everyone. Um, I am Patty Jones. I'm the Associate Director for Research at the Beppin Institute, and I am pleased to be your uh, host today for this uh, Director's Seminar. Um, as you may know, the Beppin Institute Director Seminar Series is uh, meant to feature outstanding faculty members of the Beppin Institute um, who are meant to be giving a talk that's a little bit more general than their usual very focused specific research talk, um, appealing to a broader audience uh, of all of us uh, here at Beckman. Um, so today I'm really pleased to introduce uh, to you um, Dr. Chen Chen, who is going to be talking about her research. Um, We're going to have people use the um, uh, Zoom chat feature for questions. Um, I believe it's possible for people to unmute themselves and talk at the end, but it's also handy if you go ahead and use the chat box and I can help um, and direct questions to Dr. Chen at the end of her talk. Uh, so just to introduce Dr. Chen, she is currently an assistant professor in material science and engineering here at Illinois, um, where she earned her PhD in 2012, and she did her postdoc at Berkeley under a Miller, Miller Fellowship. And she's been an Illinois faculty member since 2015 and has been honored with a number of awards, including the Forbes 30 under 30 science list, the NSF Career Award, and a Sloan Research Fellowship in Chemistry, to name just a few. Um, the research in her group focuses on the broad scheme of imaging, understanding and engineering active soft matter, including systems such as colloidal self-assembly, protein aggregation, advanced battery devices, and energy efficient separation strategies. As you can see on the slide, her presentation is titled Cinematography at the Nanoscale from Colloidal Crystallization to Protein Transformation. So please join me in a virtual welcome to Dr. Chen. Thank you. Uh, thank Patty for the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is Qian. I have a five-year-old research group in material science and engineering. My group focuses on cinematography at the nanoscale. So before I start, I'll give you a flavor of what we mean by cinematography using two illustrations made by the artist in my group, Dr. Hu San An. So in this uh, first video showing here, you can see how we can actually make movies of nanoparticles are uh, dispersed in solution, resolving not only the beautiful superstructures they can self-assemble into, but also the vivid thermally agitated motions at a single particle level. On the right, as we really go for more complicated three-dimensional uh, objects, such as a filtration membrane, this one will take a different strategy. So as shown at the top of this right movie, what we do is we piece together the different snapshots of the single object, a different orientation into one continuous movie from which we can reconstruct the beautiful three-dimensional nanoscale morphology and nanometer resolution as shown at the bottom. So the reason why my group focuses on cinematography is because we are greatly fascinated by the power of direct imaging and image analysis. I'll use the art question as an example so we all know Vincent Van Hao, and some of us know once he was really happy with a new stage of his life with his bedroom in Ahala. So what are the ways for him to share and describe his new bedroom? One way he did it is to use words to detail the shape and position of everything, like in his letter to his little brother. But the other way is actually to paint it and show in the middle. In comparison to words, a painting actually has direct spatial information, and there can be many different ways for you to interpret the interplay between light, color, and shadow. The house time did not have computers, but more than 100 years later, with advanced computation, people are able to revisit this one very old image and do extensive data analysis on the brush stroke and painting style to really re-establish the painting style itself. So, Based on this inspiration, our scientific ambition is actually on some level similar to really collect experimental data with direct spatial and temporal information. The experimental data that can actually not only be uh, interpreted by us now, but can also be revisited and reinterpreted many years later that can just stand the test of time. So it sounds like a very grand uh, scientific ambition. And that's why over the years, I have recruited a group of people with diverse backgrounds, with formal degrees from physics, chemistry, material science, engin um, electrical engineering, and chemical engineering. 
And what I expect from them is based on their different expertise, they can take care of different aspects of nanoscale cinematography from making samples, taking images or videos to analyze the data and relating to applications. What I did not really expect back then is when you have such a group of people with diverse backgrounds coming together with just a little bit agitation by me, they start to spontaneously interact with each other following the interaction potential that is defined by their personality and expertise. And just like most materials engineering process, with this spontaneous interaction, they start to see emotion behaviors as shown in this uh, selected list of our publications in the group. So based on our core of direct imaging and image analysis at the nanoscale, the systems we concern in our group is actually really diverse ranging from assemblies of nanoparticles, transformation of proteins, separation membrane, ion battery, amyloid fibrils, and even the recent, recently introduced machine learning method in data analysis. So I'd like to re-mention the most enjoyable part of my work here is that all this kind of uh, beautiful publications is really enabled by the spontaneous self-organization of my group which requires a minimum input uh, from myself, which is actually really the beauty of self-organization. So in my talk today, I'm going to talk about three types of systems. And in each of the systems, I'll show you how cinematography at a nanoscale by taking images or movies at a nanometer resolution, or even sometimes milliseconds temporal resolution can really provide us with new insights. And I'd like to re-mention, really when we talk about cinematography, it's not really just about imaging the shapes or morphology of objects, it's also about getting even chemical information, which I will emphasize towards the end of my talk. So the first type of system we study in my group is actually about the crystallization pathways of nanoset objects. So how nanosized objects, it can be a protein, it can be a colloidal nanoparticle, it can be a lipid vesicles, how they can actually come together to react against their Brownian motion to form into an order crystal. And in particular, if we really specify these nanosized building blocks to colloidal nanoparticles, their crystallization into super lattices has been a question of extensive research efforts. However, for a long time, the status of the field has been a large gap. So on one hand, in this 2016 review paper, it really summarizes the beautiful variety of nanoparticle superlattices together with their structure dependent properties and applications. However, here, those are only a single snapshot of the superlattices after they are formed. From the single snapshots, we do not really know how the many nanoparticles dispersed in solution can come together to form into a highly ordered structure. We do not really know the crystallization pathway that really determine the size, shape, crystallinity of the super lattice as well as their applications. And moreover, in this other review paper published in 2015, it actually points out a long-standing theoretical challenge to model the interparticle interaction and the nanoscale because they are non-additive. So as a result, when it comes to simulation or computational efforts to predict crystallization pathway, it has also been very difficult because it has to be relying on the interparticle interactions and nanoscale, which has been difficult to predict. So in this type of system, the unique contribution of my group is to actually contribute a new type of experimental data that is actually previously unprecedented. So instead of just showing you the final snapshots on, on nanoparticle superlattices as they formed, I'm going to actually show you real-time movies. So showing here is an example of a nanoparticle superlattice kind of relaxing themselves as agitated by thermal fluctuation. And I want to really highlight, this is not just one movie taken by accident. Over the last five years, my group has developed very robust protocols. So the understanding I'm going to present today is not just based on one system, but based on a series of different nanoparticle shapes. So the reason why uh, the nanoparticle superlattice uh, crystallization pathway in solution has been elusive is because for a long time, 
The nanometer resolving transmission electron microscope TEM is not compatible with the liquid sample. So shown in this uh, TM uh, schematic here, uh, the TM works by having the electron beam initiated from the filament, going all the way through the column and the sample, projected onto the screen to generate one TM image. So as a result, the whole column needs to be kept in high vacuum. And as a result, even if you put a liquid sample, such as a suspension of nanoparticles in, it will dry out and give you no dynamics at all. So here comes my group's unique expertise on this uh, emergent imaging tool of liquid-based TEM, which can actually take movies of nanometer resolution at the millisecond temporal resolution against the high vacuum of TEM. So there are two ways to do this. One is to use two graphene layers, sandwich a liquid sample in between, and the other is to use those uh, microfabricated chambers, which can actually sandwich a liquid sample in between, at the same time, allow in situ liquid flow and electro biasing together with TM imaging. So with this technique, our idea was, how about we really take real-time movies using liquid phase TM to really see how individual nanocells building blocks can come together to form into a crystal. This idea is very straightforward, but it didn't take us long to we recognize how naive we were because there are complications. So TEM, the electron beam in TEM actually has high energy. So it can actually react with nanoparticles if you don't really control it well. Well, this can be really wonderful if you're going to study the nanoparticle corrosion dynamics as shown in this beautiful work here. It can actually really fundamentally damage the self-assembly or crystallization. So that's why this is a challenge that is recognized by my first poster, Dr. Zhiyang King. And the first few papers he published with our group is to really to push the electron beam intensity in liquid phase TEM to as low as possible. At uh, this very low electron beam intensity range, we're able to completely eliminate the beam induced on nanoparticle reaction and also heating effects. And with those kind of complications resolved, in this uh, more recent work of Zhu Yang's, he was actually able to track and see the motions of individual nanoparticles, recognizing both their position and also orientation. And it's also because of those very important original contributions, Dr. Zhu Yang King is actually now Professor Zhu Yang King. So built upon this work, I'm going to really show you more recent results of ours on actually the crystallization pathway. And I want to really mention this kind of efforts can really push liquid phase TEM to us, which is no longer just a fancy imaging tool resolving highly confined and being intensive induced or dynamics. Instead, it can really provide us some insights and validate existing theories and telling us how to redo experiments in a more controllable way outside TEM. So the first question I'm going to address is uh, the nucleation process in the formation of super lattice with uh, this uh, gold triangular nanon prism as a starting point. So those uh, gold triangular nanon prisms, they're about 100 nanometer in length, they're about 7.5 nanometer in thickness. So in a TM image, the contrast will make them appear dark as shown in this uh, dry TM image. And then for this uh, gold triangular nanon prisms, their surface is actually coated with charged thiols. So when you disperse them in water, they will experience this random attraction which push them to come together, but also the electrostatic repulsion which will really push them to stay away from each other. And then in our liquid phase TM experiment, what we do is we load such an increased solution of gold triangular nano prisms into TEM. At the very beginning, the prisms are very well dispersed, staying away from each other, and then we really trigger the crystallization by increasing the salt concentration in the solution so that we can actually screen the electrostatic repulsion so that the vinyl subtraction will start to be dominant to drive the crystallization. So as you can see the movie, at the very beginning, you can, you can see dark shapes flying in and out, and that's because our samples are now in solution. They can actually undergo vivid running motion. And gradually, you can see a very light order hexagonal lattice emerges from the disordered structure. 
So that was very exciting to us because that was the first time people are able to really see real space, real real time crystallization of a nanoparticle super lattice in solution. And I should mention this is only possible after we basically optimize every single experimental step, which we really nicely documented in our 75 page support information, which is something I'm very proud of. And then if you look at this movie carefully, you might also get surprises. Remember we start from those triangular nanoprisms. So why the dark shapes now look so circular? And why they were actually put into a hexagonal lattice? So we wonder about these questions for quite some time, but fortunately, liquid phase DM allows direct imaging. So we're able to capture a series where individual nanoprisms sitting flat on the substrate. And then another prism comes flying in from the solution, stack on top of it, but not in perfect registry. And this misalignment can add up to really make the projection of this column more and more circular. So this is when we realize we're no longer looking at individual nanoparticles now. We're looking at a 3D super lattice, the, the prism stacking into columns, and the columns actually form into the hexagonal lattice. And even after they reach equilibrium, you can see the columns can still locally vibrate, following interesting form of vibrational modes as a way to dissipate energy as agitated by thermal fluctuation. And one very frequently asked question here is if the formation of this hexagonal lattice is driven by electron beam complications. So I should mention here, this is a value of our 75 page support information because we have done every possible control experiment to show this crystallization is generic. It's independent of this electron beam effect. It's actually generically driven thermodynamically by a balance of Reynolds attraction and electrostatic repulsion. And then after we take all the efforts to remake the movies, the next question is, what can we really learn from watching the movies? So this turned out to be a cool part of the system because from the movies, we can actually capture something that is even difficult to resolve in simulation, such as the crystallization pathway and the existence of in intermediates. So those are difficult because even if you ignore the non-additivity of interparticle interactions on the nanoscale is still very computationally expensive to simulate a large system with many nanoparticles interacting with each other while still concerning their morphology details. So this is when uh, my first PhD student, the how passion for our thermodynamics will really play a role. So using the machinery of statistical um, mechanics, he was able to do a lot of the analysis of our liquid phase TM data and extracting interesting parameters. So as an example, in this movie, on the left is actually the raw liquid phase TM movie with the columns trapped as the green dots. And then on the right, we are doing this binary cell analysis to really show the bond connection network where the color of each binary cell simply just the number of nearest neighbors. And then based on this bond network analysis, we can then really calculate two local order parameters for each single column at a given time. One is the bound orientation order parameter, which calculates how ordered the structure is. And the other is the local density, which calculates how locally concentrated the structure is. And because we can have a long movie, we can have many columns, that's how we can actually have a statistic map as shown here. So if you look at this 2D map here, you can actually really recognize two populated states. And interestingly, uh, aside this uh, one populated state with high structure order and high local density, which is our final crystal, we can also see this other state with uh, low structure order and high local density. And that's our pre-nucleation precursor. I refer to them as a solid, and liquid states because their structure features really resembles the solid and liquid states in atomic matter. And in fact, indeed, as we check the temporal evolution of this 2D probability space of order parameter, we can see at the very beginning, this liquid-like pre-nucleation precursor emerges first and then gradually tunneling into this uh, final state volatility as shown on the right. 
Uh, if we go back to real space images, we can now see clearly this is a two-step nucleation process. The nucleation will happen uh, after the formation of this amorphous blue domain, which shows here, and from which the red crystallites will start to nucleate and grow. And this process is repeated so as we collapse the data for multiple independent experiments into this uh, one single master curve here. I should mention based on the checking the fluctuation of the crystal boundaries, we can actually back out the kinetic barrier for the nucleation, which is actually lower when we have this uh, liquid wetting layer between the solid phase and the starting dispersed particles as the gas phase. So you can see in this story how the house of physics intuition can really help us understand the crystallization pathways, can really help us extract useful information from the movies. And that type of uh, fundamental training was really helpful because now instead of working on colloidal nanoparticles, he's currently a postdoc at Stanford working on the activity map of neurons towards his ultimate dream of understanding physics or psychology. And I should mention, such existence of pre-nucleation precursors seems to be universal at a nanoscale as we extend to other systems. So in this example, ongoing work done by my student, Chris Chan, will look at um, flat nanocubes. And for these flat nanocubes, the super lattice they form actually have degenerate structures shown here. So as a result, in this liquid 50 MOV with the checked trajectory traces overlaid, you can see the lattice not only relax themselves, but also can really stretch and undergo vivid orientational reorientation because they have a degenerate structures. And as a result of this uh, kind of uh, orientational flexibility during their uh, crystallization process, towards the final rhombic lattice, they can also have this uh, pre-nucleation precursor, which actually has this uh, hexagonal symmetry. And interestingly, about the same time, uh, Sharon Gloss's group in the University of Michigan actually used computation to show such a presence of pre-nucleation precursor can be universally present in uh, those different shaped nanoparticle system. So I want to point out, in course simulation, those nanoparticles are interacting through these entropically driving uh, interactions, which is very different from our experiment. So looking to the future, the puzzles we are trying to resolve is, number one, why this, this, this need of this uh, pre-equation precursor when it comes to the crystallization and nanoscale? And then number two, how we can actually modulate the crystallization or nucleation conditions so we can really control the structure, the symmetry of the precursor as shown here. And with this initial demonstration, the next question we're going to answer is actually the process after nucleation, which is the growth. So assuming this better study atomic system here, even after you can actually have a very well-defined crystalline nucleus formed in the solution. The final is post facet and the final shape of the crystal still depends on the, the growth process. So showing here these SEM images are just the typical shapes of nanoparticle superlattices. So at the same time, this uh, growth process is actually even harder to really observe in experiment or model in theory or simulation because when it comes to growth, it's already past the nucleation stage, which means the system is actually much larger because you need to have enough concentration or enough number of particles to really go beyond the critical nucleation size. And also, as I'll show later, this is also a system where not only the interparticle colloidal interactions start to matter, but at the same time, multi-scale transport dynamics also start to really matter. So my other first uh, PhD student, Bing Bing, uh, take on this challenge first, which followed by my other PhD student, Ar Yang. They are trying to really push together to understand the gross modes of nanoparticle superlattices. So Bing Bing's major effort in his PhD is actually to come up with a very, very rigorous way as we do the liquid phase and experiments in a highly reproducible way which was actually highly uh, envied by my friends in the field. So because of this unique contribution, he was able to actually observe the super lattice formation with a variety of nanoparticle shapes. 
Showing here are a few examples, the concave nano cubes, the flat nano cubes, and nano spheres. So if I focus on the first movie, while I kind of label the surface or profile of the crystal, you can see in this gross movie of super crystals, the incoming nano cubes will complete one layer fully before they grow another layer. There's no awkward protrusions, there's no random fluctuation. This is a so-called layer by layer growth. It's actually a beautiful strategy to regrow atomically smooth layer, and that's why it has been the hallmark in um, industry to regrow semiconductor thin films. And now let's actually look at the other two movies. You can see although the shape and the symmetry of the building blocks are very different, they still follow the same layer by layer growth. So our immediate question is, what is the underlying mechanism? For the sake of time, I'm going to really just focus on the concrete nanocube system, where you will see how our argument can be a generic one that can be extended to other types of systems. So being like the reading books, and his understanding of the growth modes really gets improved. But one day he came back from the library after reading this book published back in 1974 on the atomic crystallization of quartz crystals. So it turns out there are a series of requirements associated with this layer by layer growth. So the first requirement is this uh, thermodynamic driving force. So showing this schematic here, when you have building blocks that can freely sample the surface size, they might encounter the terrace, the kink, and the light sets, and they eventually fall into the most stable kink size because it has the most stable, most number of nearest neighbors. So as a result, the stronger the pairwise attraction be between the nearest neighbors, the stronger the thermodynamic driving force. And indeed, out of our simulation efforts done by our collaborator Zhu Wei and Eric Lawton of Northwestern, we're able to really show the pairwise interparticle interaction in this case can be as low as minus five kVT, which is actually a very strong thermodynamic driving force. And then the second requirement actually is about kinetics. So how can we really make sure the particles can all really fall efficiently into the kink size? So showing just the one diagram here, one pathway is actually through the so-called interlayer diffusion or in-plane diffusion, where the particles on the latch can go over a few local energy minimum and eventually fall into the global energy minimum. And indeed, from the movies, we can actually back out what is the in-plane diffusion rate, which is about 50 lattice constant per second, which is actually very fast, which is sufficient for nanoparticles to quickly sample all the available surface sites and fall into the most stable sites. And then as a comparison, when the particles become much larger, such as the micro-sized colloidal particles you show in this optical microscopy movie, the diffusion rate is now three orders of magnitude smaller. And as a result, they can already quickly reorganize themselves. As a result, their crystal front is actually really rough with atom formation here and there. And since we now understand the underlying mechanism of this uh, layer by layer growth, we can actually really even measure the in plane diffusion barrier from our experimental data. So, showing this movie here, we already have the super lattice formed, but again, the particles on the surface can still really diffuse upon themselves, sometimes together, sometimes individually. And from our statistically checked surface particle positions, and together with the rule of Boltzmann distribution, we can actually back out how the energy oscillates along the surface of the super lattice. I'm showing this uh, energy diagram here. So there are two types of information I want to highlight here. One is the values of this energy diagram actually corresponds to the square lattice position, which means the system is indeed thermodynamically driven. And second, the barrier between the valleys is actually sufficient small, less than one kBT, which means it's really a small barrier for thermal fluctuation to overcome. And I should mention, although we did not really find a lot of analogies in colloidal science on the surface diffusion, we're able to really see a lot of studies on the surface diffusion of atoms in atomic crystal growth. By taking one here, we're dealing with some um, nanoparticles, building blocks, not really atoms. 
But once we establish the full picture, we can further do crystal engineering. So in atomic crystallization, people can actually grow rough and surface of crystals by increasing the temperature. But similarly, we're able to retrieve the same rough, rough transition in our nanoparticle superlattice system. So shown in these two movies, now that we're still using the same particle, but we change into particle interaction so that now the surface actually become really rough, as you can see, with really atom forming randomly here and there. And I should already mention in, in my collaborator Eric Slaughter's first theoretical effort, we're able to show both the layer by layer growth modes and such rapid transition can be retrieved for basically broadly nano size building blocks, regardless of their size, symmetry, and chemistry, which is actually a very interesting phenomenon we're able to review using our real space imaging. And such uh, uh, an energy with atomic crystallization can be further extended. So in this work done by my PhD student Chang, he was able to really uh, realize that in addition to interparticle interactions on nanoscale, the, trans the mass transport parameters such as surface diffusion we just discussed, volume diffusion, and the balance with uh, interfacial energy, and how the lattice can actually accommodate the stream can all play a role which leads to a different growth modes, such as the coalescence showing here. So he first showed coalescence in one system of nano, uh, gold nano arrows, and then again in this other system of gold nano rods. So as you can see, in both movies, basically the nanoparticles will first form into small clusters, and the small clusters can actually merge with each other through the neck formation. And by tracking how the neck width changes with time, we can show this coalescence process really follows the power law prediction of surface diffusion driven uh, coalescence in atomic crystals. I will really find this connection across scales from atomic crystal growth to nanoparticle superlattice formation very inspirational. Maybe we can actually exchange the engineering strategies in both, in both areas to really create very interesting and exotic shapes of materials, which can actually have interesting applications in metal materials field and also as, um, as different types of devices. So, so far, this is actually the first part of our story on synthetic nano-sized building blocks. So this is all very interesting because inorganic nanoparticles are very well defined. They can form into a beautifully ordered structure, except uh, to my other group of members, um, Hilson and Fallon and Johnny. So I refer to the three of them in the group as the League of Morphologists. And the reason I really name them in this way is they actually like shapes that are irregular. They don't really like those very well-defined well shapes. They are really facilitated by the artistic aspect of shapes as exhibited by both synthetic materials and also um, biological systems. So Hugh-san came to us with a chemical engineering background, and he is really good with making beautiful animations and illustrations, as you have seen at the beginning of my talk. So this artistic view of his make him really see a different facet of polymeric materials, which is their three-dimensional morphology. So the example I'll use is this uh, polyamide filtration membrane people widely use for water filtration. So if you think about a filter for water, this image might be what you will be thinking about. You will have a flat film with pores inside through which the water molecules can actually go through. But if we really zoom in with TEM, you can see it's actually not a flat film. It has a lot of vivid morphologies in three dimensions. They actually form into the scramples with different thickness, with different shape, with different local surface curvature. So using no dose electron tomography as shown here, my group was able to reconstruct the three-dimensional morphology of these cramples, which we highlight in red, or uh, in three dimension at the nanometer resolution. We're also able to reconstruct the inner voids, which we label as purple here, which really determines the local thickness of the membrane, which actually determines the diffusion length of water molecules. And then based on this technique, Hillsong together with my student Fallon, they push further to understand this synthesis morphology and performance relationship. So as you can show 
As you can see here, based on this one single type of polymerization reaction, making this polyamide amide filtration membrane, by just changing the ratios of monomers, we are actually able to retrieve a rich type of morphologies. And right now, we're in collaboration with Professor Xiao Su in chemical engineering to retest for us how those different morphology will really change the performance. And meanwhile, I'd like to really kind of highlight this concept of morphogenesis in artificial system that we are demonstrating here in polymeric materials. So morphogenesis is basically a concept in biology. I'm showing here is an example of how gas can actually soft fold into beautiful three-dimensional complicated morphologies, and those are taken by digital micrographs. So I'd like to really mention there's a potential for us to review soft materials, like the polymeric materials we just showed here in the concept morphogenesis, and in particular at the nanoscale, because the chemical heterogeneity that is originated from the reaction conditions is usually about nanoscale. And since I covered the work with Houston and Fallon, let's now actually look at the work done by the third member of the NIC, uh, which is the who, who is Johnny? So Johnny is, uh, um, in terms of our GPU metric, is uh, one of our best undergrad of our own. And the only reason he is uh, happy to stay in Urbana Champagne for his uh, PhD study is because he wants to watch something for real. So he really enjoys watching these uh, beautiful simulations, I sh uh, beautiful animations I show here which demonstrates in living systems how the nano size of biomolecules, they can transform, they can self-assemble, they can interact with each other to perform their functions. In fact, Johnny loves, loves watching them so much that he hopes to replace them with real experimental data. And of course, that's actually a dream shared by many pioneers. So that's why there are two recent Nobel Prizes given to nanoscopic imaging techniques that is related to biological system. One is a cryo-electron microscopy, the other is a super-resolution optical microscopy. So if you know Johnny, you will know he's very humble to interact with, but yet out of his full respects to these two Nobel Prize winning techniques, he saw a disconnection and that disconnection serve as our motivation. So cryo-EM can actually really generate beautiful uh, high spatial resolution, basic and transpatial resolution images of three-dimensional shapes of proteins, but you do not really see dynamics. Those are only single snapshots. You cannot really retrieve the interaction, the transformation with an easy response to external stimulus because the sample is frozen. On the other hand, for super resolution optical microscopy, it's compatible with a liquid sample, it's compatible with the dynamics, but it's the spatial resolution of tens of nanometers is on locating the sample. It does not really give you the nanoscopic morphology of the proteins, which is actually key to their function. So our vision here is actually to recombine the merits of these two techniques to be able to resolve the elusive, to be able to actually really image protein molecules at the best possible spatial resolution offered by TEM, but at the same time also still observe the in situ dynamics in solution. So that's why Johnny has this vision of the so-called structural biophysics. So the timing was great because we already accumulated a lot of experience of liquid-phase TM on inorganic materials. By extension of this uh, liquid-phase TM technique to biological system is actually not trivial at all because a biological system, they can be a lot more sensitive to high energy electron beam. They're usually composed of low atomic weight elements such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfide, so as a result, they do not really have very good TEM contrast. So that's why as a starting point, we choose the system of membrane proteins, the proteins that actually sit across or adjacent to cellular membranes. So membrane proteins are a pro protein family that is really crucial to functions that is really governing the information or mass flow across cellular membranes. At the same time, they actually serve as more than one third of disease targets. The pro membrane proteins tend to be pretty large, so we can expect decent generic TEM contrast. They need to stay in lipid membranes. So as a result, even just as structural categorization has been difficult because for solid state NMR, they can be too big 
to interpret. And for X-ray crystallography, their bulk crystalline form may actually be very different from their function form in lipid bilayers. So that's how, by choosing this system, we earn ourselves a unique entry into this uh, uncharted territory. Our exact system is uh, nano disks. Uh, this is a technology developed by the molecular chemistry, the, mole the molecular biology department here. Uh, we have our collaborator, Professor Aditi Das, uh, really contributing to this project and then providing us with uh, samples. So shown in this uh, schematic here, uh, a nano disk actually has three components. The membrane protein show as green in the middle, wrapped by lipid bilayers are shown uh, in red, and then which is further circled by this uh, membrane scaffold protein as shown in blue. So in this way, we can actually make sure the membrane protein is still stays in its uh, native lipid environment. At the same time, the whole solution can be easily processable as a nanoparticle solution. So in this uh, three uh, stained TM images of dry, TM images of a dry sample here, we can actually see uh, different orientations of the nano disk, which really shows it has a circular disk-like shape. And for our liquid phase TM image of the nano disks, we use this uh, graphene liquid style as showing here. And I should mention this is actually already a customized technique that was really optimized by Johnny. And this is again months of effort to for us to get uh, the first ever movie, which I'll show you very soon. So I still, rem I still remember that one day at 11 p.m. when Johnny emailed me this movie, naming the first ever liquid phase TM movie of nanodisc in solution. So in this movie, the sample is not stained. You should see the generic TM contrast, which is a dark feature. It's in liquid, so you can actually see the nanodisc rotate to really show that different projected views and the scale bar is actually 20 nanometer. So from this movie, we can actually do a series of tracking of the diffusion dynamics or their shapes and their size, which matches really well with our expectation. And then beyond all those efforts to actually take those movies, then the most immediate new type of information we get is actually the spatial temporal profile of the fluctuation of the nano disks. So in this movie, uh, John actually added the green lines to re-highlight the contour of the nano disk. You can see they actually fluctuate over time in solution, and the fluctuation is still around roughly a circular shape. So we later attribute this uh, fluctuation to two types of factors. So the first factor is actually the bending and stretching of the belt protein at the periphery, which is really determined by constraints of intermolecular interaction and specifically the hydrogen bond in this uh, belt protein. And second, the molecules inside the nano disks, which are the lipids, which are POPC in this specific example, can be very fluidy like in our experimental uh, temperature, which is room temperature. So as we can see from this uh, molecular dynamic simulation result, indeed the lipid uh, molecules diffuse like crazily inside this uh, nano disk, which also causes uh, this uh, fluctuation. And then we're going to resume in a little bit more into this picture of bending and stretch, stretching related fluctuation mechanism, because we can do quite some interesting analysis there. So the analysis that is relevant is actually the so-called spectral analysis. So by spectral analysis, we mean we can actually get a contour shapes of this uh, nano disk over time, and we can do a series of Fourier transform to really get the independent in, in individual spectral components. I'll skip the mask here, but directly show you the result. I should mention, in addition to really getting information from experimental data, as a comparison, Johnny also taught himself a molecular dynamic simulation, and we can also extract the contours for molecular dynamic simulation to do the same type of spectral analysis. So the key data set is actually this plot here. The y-axis is the Fourier, Fourier components of the spectrum, and the x-axis is the Q factor, which is the inverse of the real, spa real space lens. So there are three types of information I want to see. First, the blue data points are actually our experimental data, while the green data points are actually from molecular dynamic simulation. 
So you can see at least at the high Q region, those two data actually matches really well with each other, which again shows in our liquid phase TM imaging, we're really imaging the generic fluctuation of the system is actually not an artifact driven by electron beam. And then second, in this plot, we can see two regions. And interesting beyond this, uh, one region, which is actually dominated by bending modulus, having this minus four, uh, minus four uh, power law dependence, which really indicates is the basic intermolecular forces that is determining the fluctuation. We can also see another region, which has a minus two power law corresponding to the low Q region. So low Q region corresponds to a large uh, real space or uh, distance. So this is really talking about a scarven by surface tension, which is actually more of a macroscopic parameter for the system. And thirdly, by fitting these curves quantitatively, we can actually back out thermodynamic parameters such as the surface tension and bending modulus as showing here, which we can also really do for the first time from those real space movies. So beyond this observation, so equilibrium dynamics, and sometimes if we observe the video for a really long time, we start to see surprises such as budding here. So if we look at this movie, it has a one moment to narrow this kind of stretch and then come back to their circular shape as we we'll also highlight in this uh, time elapse uh, TM series. So I should really mention that stretching is actually interesting because this is a way for the system to really have more extensive contact with the environment. I should also mention, based on the stretching movie, uh, Johnny can actually do the so-called domain analysis so shown here, which really highlights even if during the stretching process or the bonding process, we can still have a central domain that is about 10 nanometer in size that actually stay intact. And we later attribute this uh, 10 nanometer size domain as the interaction region where the central membrane protein is actually holding, the, uh, is actually holding the liquid um, molecules in, uh, surrounding them due to this uh, lipid protein interaction. And in addition, we can also do the mass transport analysis to really show this fluctuation is largely determined by the fluctuation of the periphery of the nano disk. And together with this and the simulations, we're able to really show in this system, the fluctuation of going beyond really governing by the thermodynamic parameters is also kind of determined by this uh, lipid protein interaction. And as you already mentioned, this uh, budding behavior actually has not been observed in our molecular dynamics simulation. It's possible that actually requires a very extensive sampling of time scale, which is not really possible in our current simulation. Well, in comparison, in experiments, we can easily sample minutes and tens of minutes time scale. I should also mention the existence of protein in the middle is actually very important to really keep the whole structure as uh, stable as possible. Looking to the future, so John is now pushing to really read atomic coordinates from our TM images by iteratively comparing experimental TM images, the intensity profile, and the simulated TM images. And along the line of getting as much information as possible from those no contrast liquid phase TM movies, on the right is actually a recent work of ours by Le Han, where we're able to actually use machine learning to extract information from liquid phase TM movies. And we, have, we are really actively pushing this direction so that we can have automated high throughput and high fidelity data extraction from liquid phase TM. So, so far, I hope I have shown you really the beautiful applications of uh, the uh, cinematography of the nanoscale. And for the remaining few minutes, I'm going to really talk about the last system, which I'll show you how cinematography, especially when you push it to atomic level, can actually give you a uh, real application related relevance. So this work is done by my postdoc, uh, Dr. Wen Xiang Chen. So the reason he came to us is that he wants to really understand the molecular at atomic level of performance mechanism underlying energy storage materials. And that was actually also good timing because that's when we get uh, funding from industry to study magnesium ion batteries. So magnesium ion batteries is just one of the many alternatives of the post-lithium ion batteries that's currently on the market. 
So when Shang's um, first experiment was to actually reproduce other experiments using this uh, thin of nominal magnesium oxide particles as a cathode material. And this is a quite emergency popular cathode material in magnesium ion battery. So when Shang basically just purchased the particles as the rest of the battery group would do and obtain this uh, cathode particles as shown in this SEM image here. And interestingly, when he first present this uh, SEM image in our group meeting, Bing Bing, you might still remember him, pointed out directly as a perfectionist that this TM image where these particles are too messy, some are big and some are tiny. So as a result, Bing Bing really guided Wen Shang to actually do a size selective uh, centrifugation process from which we can actually get two size populations now from this messy sample. One is this uh, population of small size nanoparticles, which is about 80 nanometer in size, and the other is the big size big size particle, which is about micrometer in size. And then in the model system of aqueous electrolyte beaker test, we can already see immediately there's a difference. So the small particles tend to really have much better performance in terms of discharge capacity than the big particle. So this is further verified in our XRD studies, uh, which Wen Xiang quickly published a paper about. And then based on this interesting size dependence, Wen Xiang was motivated to try with a system that is more practical in non-aqueous electrolyte, what people actually use for constructing magnesium ion batteries. So just to give you a little bit literature background for this uh, non for this uh, non magnesium oxide particles, for a long time people just think it's not really possible to have magnesium ions diffuse and insert in a long aqueous electrolyte environment. But we shall try it anyways. And this time, smaller size particle win again. It actually shows successful magnesium ion intercalation into the particles. It actually wins big because as our, in our control experiment for the big particles, they do not really have magnesium ion intercalation at all. So that's our continuous surprise. And then we understand the mechanism. So when it comes to energy storage materials, we are really talking about the diffusion and insertion of ions into atomic magnetic structure, so we need atomic resolution. And this is when we refer to our colleague in material science engineering, Professor James Wall, together with his student and uh, postdoc, to really use a technique which is really fancy, the technique of scanning electron diffraction microscopy. So as shown in this uh, schematic here, this technique allows you to kind of scan electron beam over a nanoparticle at uh, two nanometer by two nanometer resolution. And for each point, you can actually get a diffraction, diffraction pattern from which you can actually back out the lattice parameters together with a string. So as shown in this uh, string diagram here, interestingly, for the small particles, uh, when it comes to aqueous electrolyte, their string distribution, which basically means how lattice actually distort and relax themselves to re-accommodate in certain magnesium ions, tend to be large domains that are continuous. Uh, in comparison, in the non-aqueous electrolyte I just showed you, which shows a lower capacity than that in the aqueous electrolyte, their, their distribution of string domains is actually more scattered, which really means the magnesium ions do not have continuous diffusion channels, and that can actually explain why their performance is not as good. So this is really the first time ever one can actually map the string in a lattice material at such high spatial resolution. And looking forward, we can imagine how we can actually start to do this string engineering in nanoparticles, in other types of crystalline materials for energy storage applications, spilling beyond batteries, but also to catalysis. So with that, I'd like to really summarize what I have learned over the years from the collective work of my group. So I mentioned about super lattice formation, but such a behavior of nanosized objects can really go beyond equilibrium phase behavior, such as the driven dynamics of nanomotors or the irregular shapes of how they aggregate together, such as asphaltine aggregation, which is a multi-billion uh, industry problem in oil industry. 
I kind of touched on the concept of morphogenesis. I didn't have time to mention at all how this uh, morphology development of polymers can actually be modulated if you have a nanoscale curved surface, such as the nanoparticles showing here, or how they can actually suffer sample into interesting structures. And this is a collaboration with uh, Professor Indian School in Camp Engineering. I mentioned about string engineering and nanoparticles. And lastly, for the structural biophysics, going beyond a single nano disk or single protein fluctuation dynamics, we can also push to understand the interaction of a lot of them. So with that, I'd like to really kind of end on with my acknowledgement uh, to really kind of remind you although all those work I've done by my students with, I still need to do some job on my own, such as uh, sharing differences as shown here or actually give some random motivation speech uh, when, when the students are too frustrated with, with the challenges. So this is one of them. So if you look at this image, you can see this has beautiful scenery, but it's only when you zoom in, get into the cave of the mountain and shine light onto the wall, that you can see beautiful drawings from the old days. So that really shows again the power of direct imaging. Uh, our experiments takes a lot of money, so I need to spend a lot of time writing proposals. And our experiments, our system is basically a technical platform. We we'll welcome different systems and we we'll welcome different scientific questions. So we're growing our external connections and collaborations. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions you have. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chen. Virtual applause from all of us in the audience. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk that was so wide ranging and brought together so beautifully on artistic uh, motivation as well as all the empirical and computational science underlying those very interesting questions. Uh, the floor is now open, so I believe audience, you can unmute yourself to ask a question um, in person. Um, or if you would like to uh, put it in the chat, then I will be happy to um, relay it to Dr. Chen. So the floor is open for, we've got three minutes before we're gonna close. <laughs> so any questions from the audience? Okay, yeah, everybody should be unmuted now. So uh, go ahead and ask a question if you have one. One thing I would like to um, actually ask, which is again, you kind of returned to this at the end was, um, at Beckman, we're really interested in interdisciplinary collaboration. And so it seems like your approach is to, first of all, select people or attract people who are very, have come from very different backgrounds, and then you sort of bring them together and they self-organize. So, um, <laughs> so, um, so my question is like, uh, how much selection of you do versus how much uh, of the people do you do versus how much is it all just kind of organic people coming together? And um, like the morphogenesis group kind of, I guess, um, was created bottoms up as opposed to top down. So I'm really interested in how like you formed that, formed your group. Right, right. So, so that, that's a great question. So, so in the group, um, basically when people have different backgrounds, it's very important to encourage them to talk with each other. That's always the first step. Uh, as they talk with each other, as they have a project of their own to start with, they can actually start to learn from each other and that's how they can see, oh, this is a collaboration opportunity, or this is actually a concept that can actually glue all those different projects together. So it's kind of spontaneous on some level, but it does involve some direction of my own to actually get them to actually form into, into their groups to begin with. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, one thing I would like to remind everybody before we close, and, and uh, the floor is still open for questions, but uh, just to remind everybody that the next director seminar is November 5th and featuring Professor Marnie Bopart from Kinesiology and Community Health, and she'll be talking about extracellular vesicles, imaging, and therapy. Um, but any, right now, does anybody else? Oh, yes, uh, Professor Das has a question. So go ahead, uh, Professor Das, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, Chin. Wonderful work. So I had a question about uh, the comparison of the different systems that you're working on, which is uh, what you learn from the self-assembly processes and the nanoparticles, and separately what you're learning from the protein, the nanodisc, and the lipids. Uh, how do you think we can draw things from one 
uh, like system and apply to the other system. And uh, so you have a lot of studies done on the nanoparticle systems. So what I'm trying to get to is what can we learn more about this membrane proteins in nanodisc or even like lipid assembly or maybe lipid nanoparticle assemblies? Right, right. That, that's a great question. So, so as, as I kind of mentioned, our core is to really understand nanoscale dynamics, right? So when it comes to nanoscale dynamics, we say there are multiple levels. So one level is actually the dynamics of building blocks themselves. So that's actually what is shown in this uh, nano disk example, because the nano disks themselves can actually fluctuate. And that's why already a feature that is not really shown in inorganic nanoparticles. And the other level of dynamics is a higher level of self-assembly dynamics. Well, of course, proteins can actually interact with each other to self-assemble, so are the nanoparticles. So if we talk about the second level of self-assembly dynamics, basically the governing factor is the mass transport and inter into um, object interaction. So when it comes to the mass transport, it's largely dependent on the length scale of the building block with the objects. So we do think there will be some similarity between our inorganic system and the biological organic system, just simply because they form into the same size region, they will have very similar diffusion coefficient as such. And then when it comes to the interactions, the nanoscale interactions, as I mentioned, actually when it comes to broadly interactions on nanoscale, it's actually pretty difficult to theoretically model precisely. So a lot of simulations actually, when it comes to the more um, um, uh, self-assembly behavior, actually use very simplified interaction modeling. So what we can do using our technique is actually not only to really show the behavior that is driven by the nanoparticle or nano-sized object interaction, we can also experimentally measure that interaction. So you can imagine we can actually do our model systems or nano size or particles, or even just check two interaction proteins and from which we can actually back out the pairwise interaction potential, and which can actually serve as an input for simulation. And that can be potentially generalizable if we can have a huge library of interaction potentials. So those are the potential uh, technical ways and also fundamental aspect that can actually connect broadly the objects on this length scale. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Uh, so we are out of time. So I invite people to, uh, to contact Dr. Chen directly if you have further questions about her research. Thank you so much uh, for doing a wonderful uh, presentation at our direct Beckman Director Seminar. And I hope to see everybody back on November 5th for Professor Marty Bopart. So thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.